Stop reading books, stop watching documentaries, stop hiring more services, coaches, people, all which are disguises for you not to actually do the work. I'm curious when that's gonna happen because that has been fascinating to me. I think the thing that I am most proud of and that I spend a ton of time on, and you guys have heard it from me, and I don't know if you think I'm doing it because I think it's funny. I love when people stop watching me. I love when people hit me up and go, Gary Vee, now I'm not watching you anymore. And then I go to their Instagram account three weeks later because you guys know I'm weird and I do that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then they're just watching somebody else. I'm like, no, 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 you missed the point. <laughs> yeah, the point is doing is the only option. Doing is the only option. It's the only way to win. Work ethic is the main thing that everybody in this room controls. You're not gonna control your talent. You're not gonna control your charisma. You're not gonna control your looks. You're really not. I mean, the fact of the matter is, you, you know, you can make all those things a little bit better, but you're gonna only max them out. It's the work ethic A that makes them all a little bit better. It is the most controllable aspect of your life and your career and it's the thing that most people don't wanna do. As a lot of you know, have been following me a long time, three years ago I decided to take care of my health and I've gotten those benefits. Like it wasn't easy, I didn't wanna do it. I didn't do it for 35 years of my life. I came up with every excuse of why. I'm busier than I've ever been and I do it more than I've ever done before. So the excuses are the excuses and we all have them in different parts of our lives. The fact of the matter is, Building a meaningful business, something that you can live your life on, no matter what your needs are. Even call it $100,000 of profit in a year to allow you to live a really great life if you, know, if you don't let yourself dream of like trillions of dollars. Even that is difficult. Because if it wasn't, the math would play out differently. There's a reason that the math of the, the top 1% of earners in the entire country and taking all the billionaires, and you're talking about $400,000 a year. That's a lot of money. Yet, nobody even starts a conversation of success lower than a million dollars. Yet 400,000, data, math, 400,000 is the bottom of the top 1% of earners in this country. You know, even if we just change the conversation to I wanna make $400,000 a year, it would change your behavior because so many people in their goals to achieve these great big businesses become impatient, are looking for shortcuts, and want it to happen quickly. Which means, and I know this, which means you just start doing stuff that you don't feel good about. I've seen it in the thousands of employees I've had, which is the closer they are to the sun, the harder they work. And I'm like, aha. Uh-huh. And so I definitely feel like I learned hard work by watching my parents. Um, and so it's why I talk so much about hustle. Because it's one of the things that people can actually adjust and turn to. I, I watch people give advice completely predicated on natural talent and DNA and I'm like, look, like I get it. Like I can throw a football every day for nine hours a day. I'm just not physically built to be competitive at the highest levels. So yeah, I do think you know, if anybody watching right now, if there's anything they take away, it's like, look, like you're gonna only be so pretty, you're only gonna be so smart, like, you, like th- there's, there's things that are gonna be natural and there's things that you can actually control. I do believe, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, I don't, but I do believe that work ethic is a taught behavior. It's something you do have more control over. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think, and you know what really sealed the deal for me? Getting healthier. I was 38 years old and it didn't come natural to me. Like it didn't come natural to me at all. I hate the gym, I hate it now. I hate it, I don't like it, I don't wanna do it, um, but, I, but I knew it was important. And somewhere around midway through being 38 years old, I got serious, I figured out my system, I made the financial commitment, and I've won, right? And I'll never lose again because the system was I needed to be accountable to another human being. So it was about Mike and now Jordan, whoever else is my trainer. I'm doing it almost weirdly more to not let them down than to, and so that was the shift. And so I feel like there's a shift that can make people work harder. To me, life is broken down into complaining and not. So if you're not complaining, well then I have no, I have no advice for you.
I'm, I'm pumped. Like you did it. Like, like I have friends who make forty-two thousand dollars a year, um, work nine to four, kind of, with an hour and a half lunch and forty-five minutes of YouTube and ten minutes of bullshitting and an hour of complete wasted time in a meeting. So they're kind of working like six, you know, hours a week, right? But, <laughs> but, but they're pumped. Right. And, and, and they text me, these are high school friends, and they'll text me like how happy they are to be the coach of their kid's baseball team. And you know, like that's amazing. Like that, that seems very obvious to me. Like that's like, that's right. Like, I, you know what's super weird? I'm actually weirdly envious. You know, like I, it sounds cool. Like in theory, right? Grass is always greener, right? Like far less pressure, you know, like, like all that time with my kids, oof, that would be cool. Like, there's just like all these things that I can justify. So to me, but I have friends who have $100 million in the bank because of Facebook's IPO, who complain, who are still hungry, who want to do even more, who will complain to me, because they know I work a lot, about no work-life balance, and they don't get to spend enough time with their family, and I'm like, you have $100 million. Like, you could stay home. Like, you're in control. Like. You don't complain about it. You've made that choice. Don't bullshit me. Like you want to spend more time with your family? Spend more time with your family. This is back to what we said about keyboard warriors. I'm trying to be very careful about what I'm saying versus what I'm doing because that's how you get exposed. And I don't mean like people calling you out and being like you suck. I mean to yourself. I don't want to be exposed by myself. It's, it's, it's looking yourself in the mirror and saying like, am I doing this right? So to me, there's so many people that are talking shit about how big of an entrepreneur they're gonna be and how much they're gonna achieve and they don't work on weekends. You know, I worked every Saturday of my 20s. Like, and I talk to 20 year old entrepreneurs every single day. Lately I've been saying to them, this Saturday you're gonna have more time off than I've had in my entire 20s on a Saturday. So like before you tell me how you're gonna be bigger than me, start thinking about what you're actually doing. I can't wait for one of you to ask, hey Gary, but I produce great content, but nobody's listening. Uh, That's my favorite. Gary, I'm making great stuff and everybody's following all these crap heads. My stuff is great, why is it not working? Because your stuff is crap. (laughs) You think it's great. Your mama said it was great. But the market didn't. Amen. Amen is right, my friend. The market is the market is the market. It's always right. You don't like that people watch the Kardashians? Tough shit. (laughs) The market spoke, right? You don't like that I watch grown men run into each other for four hours a day on Sundays in the fall and winter? Tough. (laughs) The market spoke, right? You can't decide. What is really imperative in this room is to figure out how you bring value in today's modern world. What products and services can you deploy and where is the attention? What are you actually offering? Are you commoditized? And really to be very frank, given the makeup of the room, do you actually even give a crap about your customer and what you're trying to achieve? Or is it just solely about what you're trying to achieve? When I really audited some of the people that were coming to this event using this hashtag yesterday, and I looked at what they do and how they do it, you don't give a rat's ass about anybody but what you're trying to achieve and sell. And it's so quick and easy for me to taste it, it took me about five seconds. And so that's something you need to think about. Because the second you deploy selfish behavior is the second that you're losing other people's attention. I understand that you want stuff to be automated and hit one button and send an email to 100,000 people and lots of people buy it. I understand that's why it's good for you. I also understand that when that's happening to you, you delete that email before you even start reading it. I understand that you want to make a Facebook ad that sells your thing, that you want them to watch the two minute video and buy your thing, but I also know that every time you see that in your Facebook stream, you do this. Let me tell you the quickest way to become very successful at selling something. To become very empathetic very quickly. Empathy, my friends, is the secret drug of sales. I always, always only care about what you're thinking. You know why you guys like me? Because I'm empathetic. You know why you guys like me? Because I'm bringing you way more value than I'm asking for you in return. You guys know why you like me? Because I look different than people that look like me because I'm not asking, I'm giving. And so when I say to you, don't listen to what I'm saying, watch what I'm doing, that's what I mean in the macro. And then the micro, there's a reason I put 15 hashtags on every post on Instagram. 
There's a reason I ask you to swipe up and draw on top of an Instagram story. There's a reason I have call to actions at the end of a YouTube video. There's a reason I reply to so many of you in the comments. Watch those things. I can say anything I want, my behavior trumps it all. If you don't see me going hardcore on Snapchat glasses or VR, that means I don't believe in it at this second, but I'm watching it, right? I'm doing nothing. Let me promise you one thing. I'm doing nothing by accident. There's nothing I do for kicks and giggles. It's all strategic, it's all for me to collect data, it's all for me to make decisions on. So, what I'm asking you to do is pay closer attention to what I'm doing and replicate that behavior for your audience because you know it works because it's working on you. The problem is, nobody wants to put in the work and the patience that that takes. I understand why you don't want to do it, it sucks. Yet, me, who works 18 hours a day and I've proven that to you over the last year and a half with Daily V, me, who works 18 hours a day, who travels 500 times a year, who does all that stuff, is engaging with his community more than every single person in this room. You're so fancy you don't have time to reply to the three people that left you a comment on your Instagram post? I mean, seriously. Everybody loves to talk about loving their community and you care about your customer. Really? Because the 12 people I audited last night, by the way, at midnight in my hotel room before this talk so I could bring you value, when I looked at you and I looked at your stuff, you're really good at throwing your right hooks and getting people into your products and services, but you actually replied to zero people collectively in the comments of those posts. Because you actually don't give a shit. And smart winners can smell it. And I promise you, let me give you a really bad business. Selling to losers. There's cost, there's cost to everything. But one thing I did extremely well was, and I still do this well, um, is I over communicate things that I think bring value to people and I don't communicate things that I don't think bring value to people or things that are important to me that can be owned behind the door instead of in front of the door. So I think people would be really stunned by how much family time and personal time I have. Do you have regrets? Of course. What kind of, of regrets do you have? You know, you know, there's certain things that I'm not ready to talk about but I think people are, I'm too public of a figure to people know there's things that have happened in my life more recently and things of that nature. So of course I have regrets. I've, I also have regrets that I think will really help people, which is that I am ready to talk about, which is no bullshit. I should have went to a couple more high school parties. No bullshit. I shouldn't have come home every weekend when I was in college and worked in the liquor store. I should have did a keg stand or two here. No bullshit. Like I should have taken more vacations in my 20s with my buddies. You know, like, like I should have had a little more fun. The truth is, I'll tell you why that was all hard for me to say. They're micro, 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 micro regrets. These are like, yeah, they mean, like, these, I have nothing in my body, including some of the stuff I'm not ready to talk about that's like, fuck, you know? Like, I'm in pain over this. They're just like little micro regrets, and I answer this because I want people to see a clear picture on the other side. Like if this was me and you actually having a drink, the answer might have been no. The only reason I think I just said yes is because I think it's important for people to know like nobody's like, I'm just scared that I'm so happy that it seems almost like bullshit, but it's just kind of true because I always go to the same place. The, the, I'll give you an example. I think real regret is only grounded in a very small circle of the people you love. I, I really do and I've put the fucking, work in on the family side. It's funny, actually that was a really interesting segue. The fact that I can say to you no, because I've put in so much deposits on the family side, that actually I'll give you a good one. I've got a brewing regret. My best friend in the world is Brandon Warnicky. I met him the first day of freshman year of high school. Within the first six months, I'm like, this guy's gonna work with me. We did baseball card shows together. I knew I was gonna build my dad's business by then. I wanted him. I fucking courted him to be in that business from sophomore year on. And he became my partner in crime along with Bobby Schifrin, my second cousin, and my dad, and we built Wine Library. Lately, I've been feeling that we have not had enough friend time one-on-one, 
as we start going and starting to see 50 and it's something I really want to work on. I don't think there's wrong. I think somebody watching me might say you're doing this wrong. I might watch you and say you're doing this wrong. Uh, I gave some advice to a friend of mine, Ryan Harwood, in a pool in Miami a couple of years ago that I feel great about. I checked in once in the last three years, curious if he was doing it. I'm positive I'm right, but I'm not right. Because what's so interesting about being, we're all unique, but I have a sense of like how I roll. The amount of things that people have observed, including my mom, who's the singular person that knows me best, we share 83% DNA. That's obviously a subjective number, but like I'm trying to paint a picture of how similar we are. Even she is remarkably, and she is the, I am so intuitive because of her, but earlier to this podcast when I'm like, I get wrong all the time, nobody has the ability to be more right about me than my mom, and she's wrong about things. She has been wrong, she's been proven wrong, and so what that did for me, in the you know, I put my mom at the highest pedestal, uh, is, oh, me judging Dustin or Steve? Like, like, I'm gonna be wrong all the time, I know nothing about them, so what you need to know is yourself. What you need to know is yourself. For me, regrets are completely grounded in did I spend enough time with the people I love? Did you? I believe that above me, I absolutely have. That my parents today could go, and I used to be scared, both my parents, my dad lost his dad at 15. I already told you about my mom. I lived in fear. You know, actually, we didn't get on that. That one, that one is something I wish I popped up 20 minutes ago in this podcast. The fear of my parents dying because both they, of them had a parent die at a young age was a profound currency in my life in my first 15 years. Profound. And so I think because I'm on the other side of it, there's such heavy levels of gratitude that I got to keep them that I'm like pumped about it. And I can tell you today as a 47 year old man, my parents are young. I expect another good 20 years minimum, hopefully 30. They're like in their late 60s, right? I'm looking for 30. But if God forbid, I won that game in a way that a lot of people haven't. I like was with my mom all the time as a kid. I was with my dad 15 to 35 all the time. I've checked that box. I mentioned Brandon. I think about other people I love like Bobby Schiff and others that I don't spend enough time with. And then of course my kids are so young that I still wanna like milk that in a significant way, but I'm sitting a hell of a lot more pretty, I think, than a lot of people, because a lot of people have also gotten into weird places with the people they love. They fought over money, they fought over an argument, they've cut people out of their lives that they actually love, but it was their own hurt. So I'm incredibly at peace. I'd like to do more, and I think all of us do. Five years ago when we had a conversation, I asked you what your biggest fear was and you responded with, with that exact answer, which was fear of losing your parents. Yes. Um, this profound impact that your mother has had on you has become- And my father, by the way, yeah, real quick. Yeah, yeah. We didn't get there. Yeah. My dad telling me that word is bond yeah. might be the single piece inside of me that allowed me not to be the bad version that some people think I am. What would you consider is your biggest failure and what did you learn? Jeez, um, I think my biggest failure was working every minute of my 20s. And when I say every minute, I mean all of them. Like, no weekends, no friends. And I think I over, I was just too hungry. You know, like, that's why I've always liked Kobe. You know where it's like, a, like he gets a little like, it almost feels like it's a little evil and dangerous. I'm like, I get that. Like, it was, I went too far. Balance matters. And I think I resent and regret and, and I really don't, which is why I even took a pause. But I think the biggest thing I learned about that is, you know, it wouldn't have killed me to, you know, go out a couple Friday nights. Um, so I think I'm more balanced at, at 43 than I was at 23. But bro, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm really trying to manifest an answer for you. It's unbelievable how much practice I have on the inability to dwell. You know, I passed on Uber twice on the angel round from one of the people that I was best friends with while investing in a bunch of other things and that $50,000 investment would have been, would be worth $900 million. That was a mistake. <laughs> you know, um, there's, there's so many mistakes. I mean, like, I make a mistake every day of my life. Like, a lot of them. Like, especially now where I'm crippled by opportunity. Like, you know, 
Every, every day, I'm, I'm fundamentally sure of the following sentence. Every day, I'm making pretty big mistakes because I'm saying no to something that could have led to the big thing of happiness or success. I'm just not crippled by that. I just don't understand why people spend time on that. Do you think people that are in college debt spend 80% of their downtime being resentful that they took on debt for something they've come to realize didn't bring them as much value in return? The problem is it's over. Like I'd much rather, if they took all that time garage sailing and going to TJ Maxx and flipping, they could start chipping away at the debt. We have one, we have TJ Maxx is loaded with arbitrage. <laughs> it is, you go to TJ Maxx, spend $1,000 and make 4,000 on eBay and Amazon every day of the week. But instead of making that $3,000 of putting in work instead of watching Netflix or going to do something else, people would rather sit and complain why they pay. People would rather sit in a bar on a Friday afternoon, buy an $18 cocktail, and complain that they're in college debt than do what I just said. My question, I'm a full-time employee. I'm a mom of three, I have two toddlers and an infant. It's never a dull moment here at my house. So I have a very creative side to me. I would love to start like a side hustle, maybe make it into like a business one day. How does one find like their passion, their niche? I have so many ideas in my head, but like to just bring it to fruition. Write out, I'm, write, I'm write, write down all the ideas. Mm -hmm. And if you've got 17 of them, since 17 seems to be your lucky number this month, with being the 17th Go token, <laughs> do that one. Or do what I told Danny, put all, you know, on a dot board, dart board, or write them all down, mm -hmm. cut up the papers, crumple them up, put them into a hat, pull one out, and just do that. What people don't understand is when they say I have all these ideas, how do I choose one? They're really, really hiding. Yeah. They're hiding. Here's the thing, I'm a, I'm a system support analyst. So I analyze processes, workflows for a living. So then I start getting in my head and I get so far down like the future that I kind of shut myself down before um, and I get overwhelmed, right? Um, so that's kind of my struggle. Like you said to Joanne, I live in, in the know, in the world of know and like what ifs. And until I guess I, I jump into something, it's, I, I just can't make up my mind. It's scary. It's very scary, especially you're, being, you know, a mom of three. You're, I think you're worried about other people's opinions. Yeah, that too. That for sure. No, no, no that. <laughs> that. All the other shit you just said is not true mm -hmm. compared to the part we're talking about now. Okay. So you have to understand, the reason I do well in this format or like people, you know, who watch this, but I see a lot of first timers in the comments being like, fuck, how does he know? It's not that I know everything or that I have intuition and there's just not that many rules in life. What, I also what, like, I'm sorry, um, like you say, scratch the itch, right? So I have a lot of ideas or, or inventions, I guess, in my head and then I look into it and it's already out there. So how does one deal with that? I don't want to no reinvent the wheel, but. There's no such thing as reinventing the wheel. Everything that's ever been big has already happened. Yeah. So Tesla, Tesla didn't invent cars. Netflix didn't invent television. I didn't launch the first NFT project. First is not, has nothing to do with you. Okay. You're, you're looking for reasons to say no. Yeah. Because you don't want to do it because you're worried about what people will think if it fails. Yeah. There's 100%. nothing else. I know. 100%. That, like, you're gonna tell me a bunch of shit right now, like I'm analytical, or I've done the research. You're gonna give me a bunch of shit that you are using as makeup, excuses. The real answer to your question is, why are you valuing your parents, your in-laws, your, your siblings, your spouse, your children, me, the world, the discord, your friends, social media. Why are you allowing their opinions of your actions to stop you from your actions? Yeah. I guess that's the bigger question, right? That is For the sure. only fucking question. Yeah. When somebody has a ton, ton of ideas, I have a ton of ideas, I make them. You know why? 
Because if they fail, if, if be friends failed, what? Everybody was gonna go on Twitter and say I suck? I don't give a fuck. I'm not worried about other people deciding if my shit's good. The fuck are you worrying about my shit for? Worry about your shit. Yeah. I'm not out here looking at everybody else's shit, worrying about what they're doing. Get inside your own fucking world. Okay. Your entire thing and many people's things and the theme of this morning is being able to not worry about outside validation. Too many people were parented and grew up in circumstances where they lived for outside validation. Outside validation is poison. It leads to insecurity and non-action. You know what else it leads to? Ego. One of the most beautiful things in the world is humility. Do not, you know, I always tell people, do not confuse my conviction and my passion for, for lack of humility. I'm pure humble, you know why? I don't think everything I'm gonna do is gonna succeed. I'm pure, you know, the other thing is, now that I'm at this point in my career where everyone's saying all these lovely things about me in the comments, they don't make me think I'm special. I don't think I'm more special than any fucking person in this chat right now. I don't, I'm, and I'm not saying that to like say it. I just don't believe it. I yeah. don't believe it. Some people feel like they need, the way they can motivate themselves is by putting themselves out there. For example, I remember before I figured out how to get healthier by hiring my full-time trainers, I remembered always having the desire to like tweet out, hey guys, I'm 186 pounds with no muscles. This was the truth back in the day. I'm 190 pounds with no muscles and I'm gonna be at 155 by April 13, hold me accountable. So I would talk to put pressure on myself. As a matter of fact, I would argue in the macro I did that. I'm gonna buy the New York Jets. That's, a, that's putting myself in a lot of pressure. Now I enjoy that process more than losing weight or being healthy, so that's a different version of that, but I think some people talk to put pressure on themselves for action, though I think that tends to not work. I think most people talk because they're insecure and they use it as a disguise to not do. They feel like by saying they're gonna do, it kind of smoke signals and kind of makes people look over here, see, I, you know, and it just becomes the talking. I, I think a lot of people don't know what they want. And that is because, I think one of the great legacies that I'd like to live is to make happiness the ambition. And I know it's very fluffy, but I actually really mean it. And here's what I mean by that. I think a lot of people don't know what to do because they actually don't genuinely like to do things that make money. But they're so told by society that that is the requirement for success mm -hmm. that they confuse themselves that money equals success, not happiness equals success. Um, and so I think a lot about that. But I mean, I think, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with insecurity. I think a lot of it, insecurity or pseudo motivating themselves. Nikita's calling back from the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. You know, yeah. I think about it a lot too. I, I think, of, uh, I've started thinking a lot about that action because I think I've, I'm always wonder why I, only started talking after I did things. I do it a lot. I only talk about TikTok or Snapchat or LinkedIn after I proved it to myself. I actually am petrified to over talk and under deliver outside of one super North Star of the, and that's why I created clarity over mm -hmm. the last three or four years. The chase of the Jets mm -hmm. is what I'm enjoying. Great, yeah, let me just say real quick too. You can um, say anything. So your You're whole talk out. on stuff like this is like, uh, <laughs> like self-awareness and whatnot. And like, because of that, you know, that like what we're saying, like I kind of talked myself up, like I was gonna do something like with pharmacy on the side, where I was thinking I could make like a educational thing for free because that's one of the big deterrents to the medical field is cost, mm -hmm. you know, just to take my test. After I graduated, I spent maybe $1,500. Wow. And I was like thinking to myself, I could probably do this, you know, take some time, do some research, build like a test prep thing. And I sat down and couldn't do it. Didn't want to do it, I and it. I realized immediately, not for me. Can, can I put it away and you? said, I don't want. Can it. I throw something at you? I'm similar, mm -hmm. and so my way to educate or bring value was okay. I can't sit down and create a curriculum or a course mm -hmm. or what have you, but I'm just going to talk every day, mm -hmm. 
and share my thoughts and the collective is incredible education, mm -hmm. you may just want to do a in the face video or maybe you don't like that, maybe mm -hmm. audio or maybe you don't like that, maybe you just write it. Mm -hmm. You may want to not go for the grand, let me boil the ocean and make a course. Mm -hmm. What you may want to do, and this is what I love about content, is you may just want to put it out daily, mm -hmm. random thoughts, two cents that may help you on something that I wish was available to me. Mm -hmm. I am actually the human that I wish existed when I was seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just so everybody understands what's really deeply running within me was I didn't have a contemporary, fun, easygoing, like competitive yet fun, lighthearted but fucking motivated entrepreneur to look up to. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, businessmen looked stodgy as fuck and went to Harvard and or nerdy when Bill Gates hit the scene, you know? So I'm like manifesting the person I wanted to look up to. Like I would have fucking been the biggest Gary Vee fan at 11. I just, I know that. I know that to be true and you may be able to do that for the mm -hmm. 15 year old you. When they say you're shit, you're not sad. When they say you're great, you don't get a big head. Absolutely. Stop. Monica, stop. Who, what, who, what's, who, what's, what are they gonna say? That's stupid? You know what people are gonna, you know what? Do you know who tells you? That the people that tell you negative things about your thing are just people that are sad that they're not doing it. Yeah, no, that's true. It's true. Because when I do do something, then they start asking, oh, how, where'd you, you know, how'd you do it? I get it. Please, yeah. please just do it. How did you avoid the trap of like not like doing what your friends did and anything? I had good parenting. That's the truth. My mom instilled so much self-esteem in me, I thought I was Superman. That's the truth. I thought I was the best. Now whether my mom did that or it was my natural chemicals or like I predicted the future, I just thought I was the best. And once you think you're the best, you don't give a f Who the f you to say that I'm whack or you know like I'm stupid or I'm nerd, I don't give a f I'll see you at the finish line, partner. <laughs> you know, like that, that was my mentality. That was my mentality. Like, I'm real glad that high school is gonna be the highlight of your fucking life. Like, you better really, really, really enjoy these 48 months because you're gonna fucking suck in life. That's how I thought. I was competitive about it. If anybody came at me. What's crazy is, what's really interesting is nobody really came at, like, like, like when somebody's, when you're nice and you're not bothering anybody, and you're just in your own shit and you're nice, not even like you're quiet, but you're like in your own shit and you're nice. Like, hey, you know, you're nice to everybody. Like, nobody's gonna be real mad at you that I didn't drink, I didn't drink. Like, people would like make a joke here and there, but they didn't have real juice behind it, you know? Nobody really bothered me, you know? But listen, I have empathy. Like, th listen, I have no idea where you guys are from, but I have some friends from some fucked up places where it wasn't that easy. Like, when you were 12 and 13, you were getting recruited to do some shit. And it was a, wasn't as easy to just be like, I'm doing my own thing. So I, listen, I'm always careful when I don't know the backstories or every detail. So I could do it. I wasn't recruited to do some fucking crazy shit, you know? If you're lucky enough to not being recruited by local gangs to do shit, well then you have no excuses. Because my big thing is like, you're either gonna, you're either gonna define yourself for yourself or you're gonna let somebody else define you. You're gonna let your mom define you, your dad define you, your grandparents define you, your older brother, your older sister, dude from around the way. You know, you're, somebody's gonna define you or you're gonna define yourself. I'm just trying to figure out how to hack at you to make you define yourself for yourself, in yourself, within yourself, and then, then shit changes. Yeah. I got a question. Yeah, my man. How do you keep that motivation to keep grinding and working hard and doing those things? I have no choice. Like I have that. no choice. But when you have multiple things. Because I'm trying to, because I don't think I'm anything yet, man. If I told you what was in my head, you would not believe me. In terms of greatness we're talking about? Or yeah. like a terms, or? Yeah, like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not naive. I know I've made a lot of money. I'm starting to make an impact, but like, I don't, I don't read my own press clippings. I wasn't joking when I was laughing when you said important person. <laughs> like I mean it, that wasn't for show, that's just what goes through my body. I believe it. 
Like, I believe it. Like, my ambition is as great as it gets. I think I can go down all time. If I can stay alive and like, I, cause I know I wanna do good and be great. Like, I wanna do great, I, I can do both. I'm weird, I can do both. The reason I can be good for people is I'm so good at my craft, I can put 80% of my energy against it and achieve more than everybody else. Which like leaves me so much room to do other shit, which will, do you know what I want? Do you, do, and you've heard this, I think. Do you know what I really am doing here? I'm trying to sucker one of you to come to my funeral. I saw your sign outside. That's my jam, my man. If I said something here that fucking triggered a different chemical in your brain and you went on to have a great life and I think I'm gonna be pretty damn famous by the time I die and you hear I'm dead, you might be like, I should probably go to that man's funeral. <laughs> he changed my life. And you take your kid and tell him the story, that's cool. My grandkids get to see you flew from you know, Texas to come to my funeral in New York and tell them stories of how I changed your life, that's the greatest legacy of all time. And there's only one way to do that, you gotta give. What's real cool for me, guys, is that back 20 years ago, 25 years, like everybody in this circumstance wanted to be an athlete or a rapper. Everybody. And now that entrepreneurship is getting cool, it's huge. Because it's super hard to win in those games. You have to actually win the whole thing. Like, like you gotta go all the way there. Like, you know, the 18,000th the best basketball player on earth works at UPS. The 18,000th best entrepreneur owns UPS. And that's why I'm going all in. That's why I'm sitting here right now. I want to give back to the game. You know, you give back to the game that gets you there. This entrepreneur thing, I got D's and F's. I promise you, straight up, I was a worse student than everybody in this room. I was just non-existent student. Like, like when, when you said barely passed, I was laughing because I was like, I actually passed nothing. They just pushed me through because I was in a public school and they're just like, get them the fuck out of here. Right? Now I had a college, I was planning on not going to college. I was just gonna work in the liquor store and build it up, pay back my parents. My mom's like, fuck you, you're going to college. I'm like, fuck. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to college? I'm like, I'm, I'm ranked 270 out of 273 in my, my class, right? I got a 1.4 grade point average and I can't put two sentences together, right? I get a postcard in the mail from Mount Ida College. I fill out my name and address and send it and I get a thing back like, you're in. That's where I went to college. (laughs) (laughs) But what's crazy about that is through self-awareness, through recognizing the world was changing, through knowing who and what I was, the only reason I was so bad was I was milking that time because that was my last vacation. I was milking high school and college. People always ask me like, you know, when I talk, they're like, what did you major in? I'm like, Madden. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, so I just, that's why self-awareness is cool. Like, you know, when you really know yourself, like how much money do you, like, it's crazy to me how much money I leave on the table because I love the game or I'd rather spend the hour doing this. That Once you know yourself, and I've been, I've been doing this my whole life, not after I made it. I was paying myself $30,000 a year building a big business because I didn't need stuff. The money's not driving me, the game. A kid saying, come in and see some, I was laughing when he just said, coming to New York and meeting a very important person. I'm like, me, important? This is funny ass shit. You know, like, like, you know, like it's, that's cool. Making an impact, right? That's what you guys are trading on. That impact is crazy. What I figured out is, fuck, I can have both, right? I'm building an empire and making an impact because of the way it's all worked out. And now, and now I'm getting greedy. Now I'm penetrating hip hop and sports so that I can get my message out at scale to you guys. Cause I'm gonna use Kyle and Logic, you know, and those guys to get, you know? You know Kyle. I sure do. <coughs> Kyle's right in that office the other day. Wow. That's cool. So let me, let me ask you about uh, yeah. self-awareness real quick because I think one of the things I'm always talking about how like relationships are king in the classroom, like over content all the time. It's relationships so are the game of life. Yeah, and so like you should go that, shake the hand of every business owner in your neighborhood. It would change your life. One weekend <laughs> would change your life. Why? 
Because if they're running a business that's not out of business, they know something. Mm-hmm. They're doing something productive. And I'm, um, again, making assumptions based on what you told me. If it's in tough neighborhoods, they're grinding. You know? Yeah. They got stories, they got scars. So when, And by the way, they would appreciate it. <clears throat> like when you're hustling, you got your corner bodega, you got a barber shop, you just got, you get a young kid come through and just say, I just wanna shake your hand. Congrats on this business. Make, I'm proud of you. Like, they'll just be happy. Like, and then they may want to do something for you. Karma's practical. Doing the right thing is always the right thing. You, know, you talk a lot about not being number one. Like, it's not always about being number one. It's you know, can it be about being you know? I think you need to. I think you should strive to be number one, and be realistic if you're number fourteen thousand. Like, you got to try. Sure, but it's not a bad thing to not be number one. No, and I think, you know what's funny? I think I threw that in there when I talked earlier about being the 18,000th best entrepreneur. It's, you know, it's, yeah, I think that's right. I, I think that's right. I, and I think where you're going, and I'm, 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 I believe in this, which is too many people trying to be number one, and then if not, they want to be zero. Like, it's like this all or nothing game. It's just a false game. It's not, it's not practical. It's not real life. Uh, so 2020, he did 120K. His goal, he wants to increase net income to 300K. Why? It's a good question. I'm Steve right now. I... Oh, you're the, the person's not here? No, okay. no, yeah, this, this is, I mean, just because, they're on the internet. Cool, so I've heard of it. Um, I, think, I think this is, this is a good point for everybody in the room. I think right off the bat, the reason I jumped in there is that sentence is the most dangerous part of the question. Arbitrary numbers of just acceleration, I understand that people are motivated by that and I think we all have different DNA and I, I, I think that you have to respect those context points for individuals but I do believe that arbitrary numbers of growth, people take too literal and start doing all sorts of bananas shit to just hit the number that may hurt them the next year or the year after. And in general, I tend to get a little weird when people just have, you know, it's one thing to say I want to grow and I want to grow in a meaningful way whether it is financially. For me, if we're talking real businesses, which was so much of what excited me to be here, like I love the practicality of an actual business, not a financial arbitrage machine, you're normally playing long. Like it's your family business, it's your business. You're, you're, you know, not, most people aren't thinking about when they own a company of like, okay, I'm out in two years and I'm gonna you know, be on a island and get a private plane. So to me, th- that's an interesting little variable. Like is it 300K because you wanna put your daughter through college? Is it 300K just because you made up a number? The 300K was easy to understand. The 77 to the one, like it was a logical kind of jump. And there's multiple questions in there. Why not 630? You know, what about more profitable at a buck? 95 from 177. What about what about 210, but no profit made because you hired three more people because you're gonna go to a million the year after? Like it's fascinating for me about that part. But keep going. I just use that as a proxy to try to bring as much value in this talk. Um, so he so the biggest challenge continues to be getting prospects to realize that they might be giving away thousands of dollars. Uh, that's number one. The second one. This one's interesting, I feel like I have fun with this, is the egos of, of these CFOs and whatnot that I think say, that's right. we're already doing it right, thanks. I think that's right. Rick. Thanks Rick, I agree. So, couple things that I think might help some people. This has been a huge factor in my career, I've come to realize. I think it makes no fucking sense to try to convince people that are not convincible. I, I am fascinated by this obsession to like get the deal and just keep like, like the, the inclining of a no to me, and I'm out. The, the, like, like the sheer, like, may, like literally like the maybe, like I'm out. Not worth it. Not worth it. The time isn't worth it in a world of so many. And so for me, this is a game about not convincing, which people fall in love with convincing. This is a game of conviction. He's right, by the way. As somebody who probably has some of that ego when I first heard about in my 20s, like I'm in my, you know, people are gonna struggle with that. The business model's super interesting, right? They only get paid if they do the work. So it's like, 
to me, this is about him building awareness. My preference is LinkedIn organic content. It's not quite TikTok, but LinkedIn organic for this room is gold. And nobody's posting enough on it. You know, I, I, I'm just telling you, that's just the way it is in there. So he needs to build awareness. So what would you do? You bought his business. I would run, I would probably do 40 to 50 pieces of organic LinkedIn content a week and then another 40 to 50 paid or uh, LinkedIn ads to the general area where we were, if let's say we were here. I would also stand up a weekly podcast show called You're Wasting Money and so that I could film that so that I could make the ads out of it. So I wouldn't even care if we only had seven people watching at first. I would want the content from the one hour show where I would interview a CFO or somebody from the industry or a legend in procurement or my aunt or whatever the fuck it starts with. And so, and then I would use the content from that to run the ads. So the podcast is almost a proxy to my ad content needs because one of the great misunderstandings of the modern marketing ecosystem is that it's the creative that's the variable of success, not the money you're spending on it. The media plan matters tremendously, but the creative is the variable. And the more at-bats you have, so many people here gave up on Facebook and other things because they said it didn't work. What didn't work was your ad sucked. The platform's working just fine, that's why it's doing trillions. You suck. You know, like that, and that's the part that pe- the people are like, oh, Facebook sucks. Yes, Facebook sucks. I, like, it's a, very, it's a very ego game. You did three ads. Whoever's closest to the consumer always wins. And is always your vulnerability if you're not that person. So the thought of being reliant on anybody else doing the selling for your product is so scary to me. And a lot of these companies, obviously COVID was such a left field thing for this business. However, those businesses, and I've seen a lot of these businesses, sometimes one salon group is 73% of their business. And then a private equity firm comes along and buys it, who also has a cosmetics business, and they lose the account, they're out of business. So look, I mean, being in the B2B wholesale business, and then deciding you're be, gonna be a consumer-based, direct-to-consumer business is like literally going from being a penguin to a giraffe. They're completely different businesses. However, that is the answer. The answer is everybody's about to understand with the advancements of the internet and definitely the emergence of blockchain and NFTs that anything, anything that sits in the middle of somebody buying it and the actual thing is vulnerable and if you're the thing that makes it, you're going to need the person in the middle less and less over time. What technology does is it shrinks the middle. It's doing it everywhere. It did it with bookstores, it did it with taxi cab service. Like it just, that's, this is what's gonna happen. So. But they're probably, I mean, they're the main manufacturers, so they are set up to do this well, right? The problem they're is, not just it's, the brand. it's great in theory, but selling to like, doing a B2B business call and selling to like three people is very different than trying to get the whole world to buy your product. Yeah. You know, so cool, but now you're competing with L'Oreal and you know, Elf Cosmetics and you know, Procter & Campbell and Sephora's private label and Ulta's private, like cool, it sounds good, but it, for anybody here who's in manufacturing and the thought of going to direct to consumer, it's just literally a different business. Comma, it is the only way you're protected. There, there should be no businesses today that are producing for a private label or for other third party without standing up their own direct to consumer business. It's just too important. It's like not having life insurance. And so what does that mean? That means investment. That means you have to, have, you have to learn how to do Shopify or Amazon, how to run ads on social networks. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always the same game. What is the underpriced brand building or sales driving ecosystem? Let me give you an example. Do you know why so many people are called ABC Auto? Because the arbitrage in the 70s and 60s was having a name with an A in it for the yellow pages, right? Like, like I don't think people understand. This has always been the same game. It was just that the yellow pages mattered the most when you bought shit or needed a service. So people literally changed their name from like Tony's Air Conditioning to ABC because you know you show up first. That was the ARP. That's why you see so many of those trucks through the years. 
So it's, there's direct mail, local television. Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola became who they became because of television ads. They were better at it and went harder at it. Amazon is the biggest company in the world because they were the number one spender on Google AdWords the first six years of Google AdWords. They, that's how they built their company. They outspent the number two player, eBay, 10 to one. They understood that they had, you know, I'm not a poker player, but you know, you have the hand where you know the math, like you got the hand, that's what they did and they went all in. And my career has progressed because I have pattern recognition around that and every time I notice the moment, I go harder and stronger each time. So for cosmetics, 14, 14 to 30 year olds live on TikTok, live. The organic reach is absurd. First video could get two million views, could. Like, so Elf Cosmetics is something that company should Google and understand what they've done for the last year. They've exploded on the back of it. So TikTok would be the answer for me if we're going that granular. And micro influencers, I still think when your business went from five to 250,000, you are required, if you want to save it, and it's on life support, to lay in bed for six hours and DM 650 people every night and ask them on Instagram if they're willing to post it if you send them product, and, and if not, how much does it cost, and literally keep doing micro deals until your eyes bleed. Or go work somewhere, because your business is in trouble. That investment is time at that point. Cor we all have either time or money. So I'm shocked by people's non-interest in allocating time. So much of what's been good for me has been my willingness to allocate time. Time is a true asset. Intent of like that matters. So I would run, I would do podcasts weekly. I would, um, in, you know, the best part of having a podcast is you invite people that you want to be customers. It's a lot more fun to email a CFO in your local area through LinkedIn and say, I would love to have you on my podcast to speak about your financial expertise versus emailing her or him and saying, I'd like you to use my company to do business. So now you're doing a, a rule that I live by which is called the high school house party rule, which is the kid that was lucky enough in high school whose parents constantly went away and he was or she was able to throw a party at their parents' house instantly became dramatically more popular in school. They controlled the party. They hosted the party. By having a podcast and inviting your prospective clients onto it, you're hosting the party. And it tends to lead to actual relationship instead of just a sales call. You, you referenced something earlier, you said wisdom years. I found that really, really compelling because you, you referenced, you know, I think you said 20 to 30. I'm now 30, just turned 30. <laughs> so I guess I'm in my wisdom years. And one of the things- Well, I think this one's the in-between. The 20 okay. to 30 is like, okay. right? Like, <laughs> just fucking go ham. Um, and for everybody listening, this is the years to taste a lot of shit, make a lot of mistakes, have fun, try different things, like everything, eat it all. Go to the, go to the, you know, the, salad bar and try every single thing that's in there. 30 to 40 is the refinement of 20 to 30. Especially if you really go at it, you're like, okay. I remember like 30, 30 is when shit started popping for me. February 21st, 2006 is my first episode of Wine Library TV. Mm -hmm. So I'm 30, I just turned 30. And that is clear, I mean, the fact that within December, January, within three months of my 30th birthday, the very clear public data, very clear indication of the shift in my career happened three months. So that was interesting. And I think those are the, th when I think of 30 to 40, I refined a lot of things that felt natural 20 to 30. I refined my craft. I started to get to know myself better. When I think about 40 to 47, I'm like, that's an evolution of 30 to 40. I'm still refining, I'm still doing but I'm starting to get into a thought of like, okay, I like have real grasp on things. I can do some real damage. Like I'm scared in the most positive way of what I'm gonna accomplish selfish, selfish and selflessly from 50 to 60, scared. I think it's going to be banana shit. I think everything that is me right now is minor leagues compared to what I'm gonna do 50 to 60 because I now have the context of 40 to 50, which is a, more polished version of the refinement of 30, 40. And so for me, 50 to 60 feels like 
insanity. And then when I look at my 60 to 70 year old business friends, I'm like, fuck, I get an entire another decade after that decade of doing it at 100. And then I start debating what happens at 70, right? Then I'm like, 70 to 80 is still a very clear decade for a certain very small group to continue to go ham and go fucking insane. I'm curious where I'll be. I know to 70, I'll be exactly the same way I am right now. It's inconceivable I'm not. Um, Those 23 years are pretty clear to me. They're gonna look like the last 23 years. 70 to 80 becomes an interesting debate. Will I take any foot off the pedal? Will I go to a different place? I often fantasize of like going into like a cave in Peru and whoever wants to find me can come and we get 30 minutes and I just do that for the next 30 years of my life. I don't know. Obviously there's that very silly but very emotional goal of buying the Jets for me that's more fun to chase than eat. Like I almost think I the first time I might feel actual unhappiness or weirdness or some sort of version of like, uh, might be if, if I buy the Jets. Like I think about that a lot. I'm like, if this happens, was this such a romantic journey? This is not 30 and 40 and 20 year old Gary thinking it's cool to say this. This was 12 year old Gary telling Robbie Turnick and Eric Godfrey, I'm gonna buy this fucking team. This has been like a thing, like actually, like forever. On, on that point of those wisdom years, yes. one of the things that came out of my refinement as you call it and my kind of maybe I'm at just at the start of my wisdom years yes as I look back on my perspective on and exactly what you've talked about on like hustling and like my own um insane luck of being a very optimistic person yes. in the worst situations and I wonder I say Steve is mindset a privilege and if and if it is because you described yourself as being as happy you've always had this this drive this motivation is there a risk in us if mindset if our mindset is a privilege in trying to ad- advise others when they don't have the same privilege. Couple things. One, everything's a privilege. Yeah. Do you see what I mean though? Like, of course I, I, I do. I got really scared. I think in I the think last it, two oh years. No, this is incredibly powerful. Yeah. First of all, as a whole separate and intriguing conversation, everything is a privilege and everything is a vulnerability. And this is like an incredibly important subject to talk about. I think mental content is the ultimate privilege. Yeah. Amen. I think the second one is beauty. I'm fascinated that we haven't gotten yet to attractive privilege. When I look at men and women navigate this world, there's nothing more clear to me in the privilege that, like like they're like white male, I'm like attractive privilege makes that shit look fucking minor leagues if you look at the data. So let's look at that then. But I'm gonna put, I wanna go back because I don't wanna lose it and I will lose it because I know how we roll. (laughs) Uh, I have no interest in thinking that I'm telling anyone what to do or giving, I do not think that I'm giving advice. I really don't. And I don't touch on this enough and I have touched on it at times and this is a great format to touch about. I have no belief that I'm right. I have no belief that I'm giving advice. I have no belief that anyone listening to this should do what I'm saying. I am putting info into the system and I'm hoping that people can extract something of value for them based on their own self-awareness of themselves. Most people don't have self-awareness. I'm aware, which is why I talk about it so much. Yeah. But- There's a reason I talk about self-awareness so much, why it was a pillar of my last book, why it's a big character in V Friends. Self-aware hair, self-aware hair. The tortoise and the hair. Yeah. I think people don't, one day when I'm, you know, I think 47 year old Gary for cynics and people that were watching, is better than they thought it would be than 27 year old Gary, Hmm. right? Like the hot takes on, I'll never forget when I hit the scene on Twitter, the whispers at conferences, I could hear them in the back room, in the green room. And I definitely read it on Twitter because I was like popping. They're like, out of everyone who's popping on Twitter in 2007, the consensus was the only person that won't be here in a decade is Gary. Because it was too hot, too fast, too much. People literally, I'm empathetic. When you have this kind of energy, I'm empathetic to how this story plays out for different people. I get why the person burns out. I get why the person really does the ultimate bad thing and disappears off the, fr- I get what that, but that's because I'm not on the extreme insecurity side. I'm on this other side. So I always knew. So, but one of the things, so I, I get a lot of like joy out of like knowing that so many people didn't think I'd be there and I'm at the top of it. Same way I feel about V Friends. Nobody has a clue, including my inner circle, of how much thoughtfulness 
I did in character development. This is my Disney, this is my Sesame Street, Big Bird, Mickey Mouse, right? Optimus Prime, Pikachu. Like self-awareness is profound. The story of the tortoise and the hare is profound to every listener of this podcast. There's not a single listener right this second that's listening here right now, if they're eight or if they're 88, that isn't extremely vulnerable to the lack of patience because they're too ambitious. It's the reason they're listening. So self-aware hair for me is a phenomenal story I get to tell for the next 50 years and I can't wait to make self-aware hair more famous than Gary V is today because that will be the way I scale putting positivity into the world, V friends. And so I'm excited about that. But back to your point, my friend, as long as you come from a place of humility and understand that ego kills people. I, yes, we have some luxury of mindset and communication, but for me, I don't think people should listen to me. I, should, I think people sh- should listen to everything and try to find positivity and usability out of everything. And they should dismiss what is clearly negative and selfish and they should triple down on everything that is selfless and positive. And that is the answer to your question that started here. What should people do? They should be very, very focused on trying to do the following. Lean in dramatically more to things that are positive. Your grandfather, podcasts, upworthy.com. Lean into positivity. Then they should be on the awareness, eyes wide open, on is this delusional and lacks practicality? Like, you know, if I just dream it, it will happen. No. Lean in, cut out. Literally, when this podcast is over, step back, audit your entire life from the people you spend time with, your family, your friends. Look at every person you follow. Are they triggering your insecurities for their own self-interest? Or are they trying to put love into it so that you go on and do your thing? Watch. Look for it, but whatever you do, back to like working out, like, you know, protein. And you know, when I, when, you know, when Mike Vacanti is like, all right, you did a lift, like protein. I'm like, really? Okay. And like during COVID, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm starting to finally get some muscles. Oh, because I was doing protein as fuck after lifts and not after not lifts. I was doing it right. Here's something right for everyone. Cut out one hour of negativity, add one hour of positivity. If you're listening right now and you're like, ugh, social's such a drag, it's because you're in a drag mindset and the algos and the people you follow are following you. You know what my social looks like? Fucking sunshine. I'm being dead fucking serious. You know what my algos look like? Fucking sunshine.